I had a crazy idea for this video. I opened up Google Scholar and typed in dog aggression and pressed search. And now I will share with you a summary of the top 10 results. I did not handpick them. It is just the top 10 peer-reviewed articles that showed up for me. It is Jose here from Tremi, please. Let's go. This was a lot of work. Hopefully we learn some stuff, but before we start, a few important notes. Each of these 10 studies have several limitations and the authors mention and disclose that. Many of them rely on questionnaires and people's opinions. We can't even know for sure if people were correctly identifying the breed of their dogs. Often, the authors were able to establish correlations which, scientifically speaking, are less strong than causality. With all that said, looking at scientific papers does allow us to establish some general trends and learn some stuff. So, grab a cup of coffee and let's get started. This first paper from 1997 looked at the use of a test to assess aggression in dogs in the Netherlands. The goal was to use the test to exclude particularly aggressive individuals of certain breeds from breeding. They exposed 112 dogs from various breeds to several situations, including humans using certain objects or interacting with the dogs in predetermined ways. They also used stimulus dogs or decoy dogs to see the reaction of these dogs being tested. It was found that indoor situations elicited more aggressive behaviors than outdoor ones, and that some dogs reacted more aggressively towards men. The authors also cautioned that the stimulus dogs used for testing should be selected carefully and not be too aggressive, as the test itself could result in learned aggression. When I was reading this paper, I got the impression that a lot of the dogs used in this study were over threshold in many of the tests. The results showed that dogs with a bite history were more likely to show that behavior during the tests, and this was specific to whether they had bitten other dogs or people. They concluded that the tests and its subtests provided a useful method for assessing aggressive tendencies in dogs. Okay. The next one is a 2013 study from the UK that used questionnaires to measure the prevalence of aggressive behavior towards other dogs. The data showed that aggression directed towards other dogs outside the household appears to be a significant problem, with over 20% of contributing owners reporting this behavior. The study found that dogs did not tend to show aggression in multiple contexts, which is consistent with dogs learning behaviors in a specific context rather than being inherently aggressive. In this study, the owner's sex, dog's sex, or neutering status were identified as risk factors for dog-to-dog -dog aggression, while owner age and dog age were found to be significant factors. Owners under the age of 25 reported more dog-aggressive behaviors than people over the age of 60. This can probably be related to things we tend to do differently as we age, how often we go out, the times in the day that we go out with our dogs, etc. As for the age of the dogs, according to this study, older dogs showed more aggression towards other dogs than younger ones. The majority of owners used a positive reinforcement-based approach, while a smaller group also used corrections in their training. The results showed that the use of aversives was associated with an increased risk of aggressive behavior in dogs. For example, aggression between dogs in the household was 3.8 times more likely, and aggression towards dogs outside the household was 2.5 times more likely when these techniques were used. Hey, do you have any idea how much veterinary treatment for aggression incidents costs? The next paper touches on that topic. This 2020 study reviewed news reports about dog-on-dog -dog bite incidents in the UK to gather information about these incidents to determine the most common mitigating factors. The findings show that in the majority of documented incidents, a medium-sized dog initiated the attack on a smaller sized dog. The victim dog's owner intervened approximately half of the time and often suffered injuries, most often to the hands while trying to defend their dog. Significantly more attacks occurred during the summer months, which is a trend seen in human dog bite research as well. While a range of breeds was reported in the incident, in one quarter of the cases the attack was described as being carried out by a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. However, 
The authors mentioned that it is important to note that staffies are often perceived as aggressive and dangerous, which could lead to misidentification or stigmatization of the breed. In addition, news articles may only report the most severe cases and may be more likely to focus on specific breeds. Most of the dog victims in this study appear to be small breeds like Chihuahuas, Yorkshire Terriers and Jack Russell Terriers, which may be in part due to small dogs being misidentified as prey or displaying behaviors that somehow trigger an attack. In addition to physical harm, many incidents resulted in serious psychological effects on the victim's dogs, often labeled as traumatized. The study also found that the average cost of veterinary treatment as a result of these incidents was nearly £1,900, or about $2,500. Only four of the reports stated that the costs were covered by insurance. Based on the findings, the study recommends that dog owners keep their owners on a leash around other unfamiliar dogs and in unfamiliar places, ensure their dogs are well trained and well socialized with other dogs, and consider control measures like muzzles if their dog has a history of aggression. Okay, before we move on to the next article, let's take a moment to see if you can ID this famous dog in history. Leave me a comment down below with your answer. This 1997 study aimed to evaluate the effectiveness of a rehabilitation program in reducing dog-to-dog -dog aggression in the short term. The rehab program included desensitization, positive reinforcement, counter-conditioning and positive human interaction. The study was conducted over 11 days and the results were evaluated on day 0 before training, day 11 after training and day 18, one week after the last training session. Most dogs showed a decrease in aggression scores, aggressive body postures and an increase in less assertive postures from day 0 to day 11. The aggressive body postures observed before training such as facing the stimulus dog and stiff posture decreased and the less assertive postures such as lowered neck and ears back increased. The study suggests that desensitization and positive reinforcement may have reduced the anxiety by weakening the association between the threatening stimulus and negative emotional reactions. They also say that counter conditioning may have helped dogs better control and cope with aggression provoking situations by providing alternative behavioral options. The study found that control dogs, the ones that did not receive any rehabilitation training, showed a significant increase in aggression scores on day 11 compared to day 0. More growling and higher ear postures were observed in these dogs. In addition, control dogs showed a greater increase in muzzle leaking, which is thought to denote anxiety. The results suggest that rehabilitation was effective in reducing aggression in dogs in the short term. However, when a smaller sample of dogs was retested on day 18, there was no evidence of a sustained effect of rehabilitation on aggression. The authors concluded that 10 days of rehabilitation was not enough to prevent later increases in aggression once treatment ended and that more research was needed to determine the optimal duration of treatment to sustain the effect. And now we have a 2020 study in which the relationship between dog and owner personality profiles and dog aggression was investigated. The findings showed a strong association between the two, with dogs classified as aggressive towards humans, being less sociable and having owners with higher scores for neuroticism. The findings support the hypothesis that owners with lower scores of extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness and emotional stability own dogs which are more susceptible to developing owner-directed aggression. According to the authors, this study was the first to confirm a relationship between owner's attachment style to pets and dog aggression. It highlights the importance of considering both dog and owner personality in understanding and addressing dog aggression. Okay, we've got some more to go, but feel free to stand up for a second and stretch. Oh, and maybe click the like button if you are enjoying this content. Cute photo as a thanks. This 2019 study aimed to use the Dunbar Bite Scale by Dr. Ian Dunbar to understand the circumstances in which dog bites of varying severity levels happened in the city of Calgary, Canada. 
The authors found that significant predictors of bite severity include the breed group, location, age of victim, sex and age of the dog, and the year of the incident. The results showed that 51% of the reported bites were of low severity, levels 1 and 2, and 35% were of medium severity. A level 3. Additionally, over 50% of reported incidents were low severity, indicating the effectiveness of the city's public education efforts on dog aggression issues. The study also found that children, youths and older adults all had higher chances of a bite of any severity than adults. The results also indicated that the probability of a high severity bite was higher in older adults than in adults. The authors mentioned that the most severe bites occurred in the home and in all age categories compared to other incident settings. Additionally, the results show that older dogs had increased odds of bites of increasing severity. They highlight the importance of education programs for dog owners and the general public about safety around dogs which should target all demographics. Let's go to Italy next, shall we? A 2020 study examined the relationship between dog breeds and aggression. For this one, the data were collected by certified veterinary behaviorists who consulted with dogs and their owners. The study found that breeds belonging to FCI 1, 2 and 3 were largely represented at about 57% of the sample. Those groups include sheepdogs and cattle dogs, pinchers, schnauzers and terriers. Pit bulls were also highly represented at about 12.4% of the sample. When compared to the general Italian dog population, the breeds in the sample of biting dogs were more numerous than expected. For example, the frequency of German Shepherds in the sample was 11.8%, whereas in the general dog population it was 5.51%. For crossbreeds and mixed breeds, it was the other way around. 23.5% mixed breed dogs in the sample, whilst in the general Italian dog population it was 36.5%. The study found that more males were reported for episodes of aggression compared to females. In the group of dogs aggressive towards other dogs, aggression was associated with living in a multi-dog household and a low level of exercise. Entire and spayed females were the most frequently reported for dog-to-dog -dog aggression. They recommend good management as an important factor in preventing aggression. The authors list several limitations of this study and also refer that the belief that neutering reduces the risk of aggression is not supported by the evidence and is still being debated. This 2008 US-based study reported on breed differences in regards to how often and how severely aggression towards strangers, owners or other dogs happened. The study found that there was considerably variation among breeds in terms of aggression, but also that there is substantial variation between individuals of the same breed. Some breeds were aggressive in most contexts, while others were more specific with aggression primarily directed towards unfamiliar dogs. The study also looked at stranger-directed aggression specifically and found that some popular breeds, such as Dachshunds, Chihuahuas and Poodles, were rated highly for aggression towards strangers, while Basset Hounds, Golden Retrievers and Labrador Retrievers scored low. They also reported that pit bulls had relatively average scores for stranger-directed aggression. Akitas and pit bulls had elevated scores for dog-directed aggression. It is emphasized that while breed can provide some information about potential for aggressive behavior, individual dogs should not be labeled as aggressive solely based on their breed given that many factors can influence a dog's behavior. Now, here's an article that might surprise you, at least initially before we dive into some of its details. A 2016 study from here, where I live in Melbourne, Australia, investigated the correlation between various factors during puppyhood and the presence of aggression in adult dogs under the age of three. This study found that early exposure to other dogs did not protect against dog-to-dog -dog aggression later in life. In this sample, the average age at which dogs started going out for social exposure was 13.2 weeks. This is too late to start socializing puppies and I assume that it has to do with a lot of new puppy parents still getting outdated advice about when to start going out with their puppies. Surprisingly, these findings make sense to me. Here's why. If I understand this paper correctly, the parents of these puppies 
were taking them to dog parks and just freely letting them quote unquote play with unknown dogs and they were assuming that this constituted good socialization. Well, you might know from some of my other videos that signing up your dogs to fight club at the local dog park is not a great way to socialize them. In a nutshell, socialization is much more about controlled positive experiences. For example, being in the presence of other dogs calmly and receiving reinforcers. Back to the paper, the authors mentioned that the study was not able to measure the quality of social exposure that the puppies were getting and recommended more controlled settings such as puppy classes. In this sample, 34% of the dogs displayed aggression towards unfamiliar dogs. The study also found that age, source, breed and use of physical discipline were also associated with aggression. The authors even say that physical discipline in puppies is not beneficial and may contribute to the development of aggression. In this sample, the gun dog breeds were found to have lower chances of being aggressive towards other dogs when compared to unknown or crossbreed dogs. Back to the UK now and this 2014 study examined the occurrence and risk factors contributing to dog aggression towards people in different contexts. They analyzed behavior such as barking, lunging, growling or biting towards unfamiliar people entering the house, unfamiliar people outside the house and family members. Aggression towards unfamiliar people was more prevalent than aggression towards family members. Most dogs did not show aggression in multiple contexts, suggesting that the behavior may be situation specific rather than a general characteristic of the dog. Several risk factors were identified that were associated with increased or decreased risk of aggression. The increasing age of the dog was associated with an increased risk of aggression towards unfamiliar people both entering and outside the house. Female neutered dogs had a reduced risk of aggression in all three contexts. The study also found that dogs in the utility and hounds groups had an increased risk of aggression towards family members compared to crossbreeds. However, in this study, there was no specific increased risk for individual breeds. Gun dogs had a reduced risk of aggression towards unfamiliar people, both entering and outside the house. The source from which the owner acquired the dog was a risk factor for aggression towards household members, with dogs from rescue centers, pet shops and internet sites scoring higher in this category than dogs from breeders. Attendance at puppy classes was found to reduce the risk of aggression towards unfamiliar people, both in and out of the house, while attendance at ringcraft classes was associated with reduced risk when outside the house. The use of positive punishment or negative reinforcement based training methods was found to be associated with an increased chance of aggression towards both family members and unfamiliar people outside the house. This 2018 study aimed to quantify the effects of several factors that determine dog ownership satisfaction among 977 Dutch dog owners. The results showed that the probability of being very satisfied with one's dog was partly explained by the perceived relationship with the dog, particularly with the perceived costs of ownership and with the dog's aggressive behavior and disobedience. Unwanted behavior and high perceived costs of ownership were also identified as early warning signals of a less optimal relationship that could eventually result in dog abandonment. The authors did not find a relationship between dog ownership satisfaction and dog obedience class attendance. The study population consisted mostly of satisfied dog owners, with 76% of dog owners reporting the highest level of satisfaction. This limited the conclusions about less satisfied dog owners and the rest of the Dutch dog owner population. So, with all that said, what did we learn? Well, for starters, I was surprised by how much scientists have been focusing on breed tendency and how it relates to aggression. As you could tell from these studies, for the most part, what is detected in a given sample is not necessarily detected in a different population. Also, don't forget that dogs are individuals and there is a lot of variation within any given breed. 
I was not surprised to see these studies not in favor of dog training methods that use corrections and positive punishment as teaching methods. We learn that traditional obedience classes and late casual exposure of puppies to other dogs without a good plan do not result in dogs that are less aggressive towards our dogs later in life. Puppy classes, however, seem to be a good idea for the dogs in one of these studies. It would have been amazing to have seen some studies on the topic of quality, force-free training and the impact it has on dogs' lives. I reckon that will be a big trend in the future. Unwanted behavior and aggression are a source of owner dissatisfaction and even financial stress. Certain smaller breeds are more often the target of aggression and the same seems to happen with children and older adults. It was interesting to notice that two of the top 10 articles mention money-related issues, either regarding the costs of looking after a dog or the cost of veterinary procedures after instances of aggression. Finally, dogs that are not super comfortable in the presence of other dogs or unknown people are very common. They are not rare or different and we should try to adjust the types of situations that we put them in. Could you leave me a comment down below with the keyword science? That will let me know that you watched the video to this point. This video is supported by all of you that have offered me a coffee or a few coffees. It is an easy, fun and informal way to show your support for this channel. If interested, I will leave a link in the description below. Perhaps more important than understanding general trends in dog aggression is to learn protocols that can help dogs showing these behaviors. You can find that in this video here. Muito obrigado e até a próxima!